the in conversation on this Friday, on this Wednesday, November 18. It's wonderful to have you all here. As you know, the conversations are um, my way to bring you into the studio of the artist and uh, to um, take you to meet them, to learn about their process and uh, to um, um, understand what it is that makes them happy. So today we have uh, two guests, Michael Crane, who is the CEO of Cranfield Colors and Gemma Gunning, who is a printmaker. And this is the third in our paper series. The paper series has taken us, you might remember, from bookbinding with Kate Holland to a newspaper collage, news, newsprint collage with Kate Lewis. Last week, we discovered the world of paper sculpture with Sue Blackwell. And today, I thought that it was about time that we really got into you know, what we do with paper, which is mostly printing, or that's at least that's how it originated. Um, I met Gemma about six weeks ago when I was in, uh, in England. We were doing our tour of Somerset, and um, it was just fantastic to discover her studio and meet her. And what was interesting also for me is that the day before I met her, uh, we took a workshop with Kate Holland on bookbinding. And the day after I met Gemma, we took a workshop with Kelvin Smith, which was a letterpress um, workshop. So, you know, either side of meeting her, I had experienced the, the paper side. Um, by the, the folding and the touching the, uh, the weight and the grain of the paper, the crease, uh, how frustrating it can be to try to do a square, perfect razor uh, sharp edge. Uh, when you think it's easy, it is really is not, but how satisfying it was. And then the day after um, I met Gemma, we experienced the ink the, uh, the sound of the ink, you'll hear that in a moment. I was so surprised when you roll the roller on the plate with the ink, it has a very distinctive sound and the artists pay close attention to that. And then obviously the scent of the ink. So that uh, paper series is, has been for me a very sensorial uh, experience. And we're gonna try to uh, share that with you um, now in the, uh, in the next uh, hour. Yes. Uh, so tell us a bit about that. Okay, so um, this is a, a real short drone kind of video that we took. Um, our, the new studio is nestled in an industrial state in South Bristol. So we've got this really high ceiling um, and it's a vast space compared to what we were all in beforehand. So there's three of us in the studio and two other printmakers. Uh, the studio is called Bristol Print Atelier. And it's a mainly a space for us all to explore our own practice, develop our own work. Um, but come January, we will also use the space to teach workshops, work one-on-one -on -one with people uh, and to do auditioning. You have a very unique concept. It's the concept of decay. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about it. Why decay? What does that mean in your practice, decay? What, you know, what uh, what attracted you to it? So it began on my BA when I so I did um, I did a undergraduate degree in drawing, and it was a very kind of broad broad subject. So we could basically as long as we could justify something because of drawing, it was a drawing. So I started looking at the landscape of the impact humans are having on the environment. So looking at traces. So that was a build up of billboards, textures, decay. And it wasn't until I moved to Bristol and I discovered this ruined building on the harbour that decay kind of started to, there was more of that that got involved in the process of my work. And for me, decay in a ruined building, it kind of signifies a passing of time. So, you know, there's these layers of rust and debris and it, it it signifies change. You know, there's economic decline, there's industrial decline. And for me, visually, it's very stimulating. And 
the materials that I use then resonate with those environments that I'm recording. So when I'm using metal and acids, I'm enforcing decay on that plate, which is what we're doing to the environment every day. We are having an impact, whether that is through graffiti or you know, natural weathering off a building. And that is what kind of sparked my imagination and that need to kind of the texture. I love texture and that is important in my mark making within my process. Right. So to use etching, like there's, when you use etching or lithography, the amount of marks that you can get is insane. And they really do resonate with the, the, those decaying marks found in buildings. Great. So we're going to come to the uh, to the process just now, but I, I'd, I'd like to stay a little bit on, on that concept of uh, that idea of decay. Is it is it for you just the, um, I mean, I know it's not just the visual impact. I mean, you just mentioned recently that the impact on the environment for you is important and uh, we'll discuss that a bit further as part of your practice, but is it for you that you're trying to stop time or that you are against change and you think that change should be more considerate of what's happening? Um, I do think it's about stopping time. It's more about recording time. So these buildings that I'm, I've, I've come to discover, they are in a state of flux. Uh, they're in like a no man's land where um, a company or a business have, has just kind of locked the door and left. But then what? there's a magical moment where nature starts to reclaim and there's this juxtaposition between these hard structural lines, but then there's a softening of you know, nature kind of climbing up pipes and window sills and coming through windows. And that then creates narratives of who was once there, what were their jobs, what, what kind of lives did they lead in this industry? Um, did they have good working conditions? Who else has been in here? Because often or not, you know, these abandoned spaces are completely filled with graffiti. And so it, it almost becomes like a like a living museum almost, you know, a kind of collection of the past. Um, so yeah, for me, it's more about the recording of the passage of time rather than stopping time. And I mean, we're gonna see some of the photos of the places that uh, you took that inspired you. There's still real objects. I mean, you have uh, a photo of a place that used to be probably um, um, a weaving place and that has all the the, the threads and then there's another one where there's a, a pair of boots there. Do you feel a little bit like a voyeur almost? Oh, sorry, a warrior. A voyeur, someone oh. who, you know. Yeah, um, I, I suppose I do in a way because um, often not you're in these buildings and um, you, you, the amount of stuff that is left is unbelievable. Um, this is the one with the welly boot, which we'll come across later, that is an old, um, Cope working factory in Wales. It's actually not far from where Michael's uh, factory is. And that was a huge site, it's like 80 acres, but it they had just locked the door one day, shut down the plant and walked out. So the amount of paperwork, the amount of machinery was all still there. And for me, that is, you know, there's, the, there's that history that needs to be recorded because at the moment that site is actually being demolished. So you know, the, the, the printmaking that I'm making is almost a form of documentation for recording these spaces. Right. But, but, it, but you also, it's your interpretation of what it is because your uh, images or your pieces are not exact reproduction of what it is. It, you put a lot of your own imagination in it, don't you? I do, yeah. So the prints that I end up making are an am amalgamation of photography that I take on site and drawings that I make in a sketchbook. Um, and when I'm drawing in a space, that is, uh, you know, that is kind of key because I'm capturing um, in that brief moment what I find the most fascinating element of the, the ruin, the, the decay. Um, so they're not meant to be exact records. It's more like uh, through an artist's lens of the, the documentation of these places and sites. Right. Um, we were, I think that when you go in there, I imagine, did you feel the presence of the people a little bit? Absolutely. Especially when you've got, you know, work mugs with their names on or lockers with people's names on. 
Um, and then the Coke works, there was billboards, um, you know, whiteboards where they had written like tasks for that week. And the date it was like 2002 was the last time someone had written on that board. So you do feel when you're in this space, like that's when those narratives start to come into play. Like, well, who's John? And, you know, what was John drinking that day? It all shut down. And, um, you know, you start thinking about all their stories and the, the past inhabitants. It's, and, and I agree with you. I mean, it's extraordinary that we are able to erase the history yeah. of people. That's really what's happening. Yeah, and, and that's happening. Like, so in Bristol, I moved here five years ago. And when I first moved, there were so many abandoned buildings along the harbour, um, even a, a little bit outside of Bristol. But um, it's becoming a very desirable, desirable place to live. So those buildings have been completely... Um, demolished and in re and what you've got in replace is a flat that you would find in every other city so you could be in the heart of Bristol City and you could it feels like you're maybe I don't know in Liverpool or Bath or London somewhere and um, so yeah we're, we're kind of um, almost erasing our industrial heritage by just knocking them all down uh, so for me, that is the importance of kind of going into these places and recording them before they are completely gone. Yeah, no, it's um, it's. I think it's really important to uh, to do that and uh, and to acknowledge that the reason why the city is so prosperous now or the area is doing well is because so many people have dedicated their lives to to creating that wealth and and living there working there and not acknowledging it and not honoring it i think is uh, is a big mistake that we are making as a as a community as a society um did you always have that interest as a kid where did you grow up uh, no i actually i grew up in the countryside so um i grew up in a small town on the edge of a town so like fields were my playgrounds, like hay bales. And I didn't grow up in an industrial city at all. And it was only moving to Bristol that sparked the interest of um, like historic buildings. Uh, I, yeah, I love visiting um, towns and I've always, always, always had a love for the urban environment. So it was always a treat to go to London or go to a bigger city living in a small town. So the you know, the ornate details of a, a large city was always drew me to those places. Right. Um, and then it wasn't until I moved to Bristol and realized that there was a lot of them that were actually decaying and that I was like, oh, this is really sad that these are being completely gone. You know, they're, 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 ba they're fading away almost. Um, I should do something about that and start draw that's when I started drawing them. And then it's just become an obsession and a lifetime project. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so let's see how you uh, create these, uh, these, these memories or how you record these memories. You're using uh, two different kind of process. And what I'd like to do is um, if we can go to your, um, to your bench where you're going to show us um, how that works. And uh, we're going to also see the inks you use, and I'll ask Michael to uh, to jump in at that time. I see that there is a. Before we do that, I see there's a question or a comment here uh, from Martin. Um, Gemma, having produced a body of work, how do you envisage engaging with a wider community using that work? Is it going to be by exhibiting, selling, etc.? Uh, so this year. I was commissioned by the Townscape Heritage Project in Birmingham, and they commissioned me to make two, two bodies of work that recorded two abandoned factories in the historic Drury Quarter. And the reason for that commission was to engage people in our historic buildings and the fact that they are fading away. So that exhibition also included a series, like three workshops, two artist talks and a panel discussion. And not only was that obviously engaging people in printmaking and how I make work and um, other artists like photographers. It also then engaged people about their community and their environment and to actually kind of walk down the street and pay attention to buildings. So, you know, looking up at the, the you know, ornate details of windows made by the Victorians, for example. Um, so that's kind of how I engage people in my process and practice is that 
as well as my own practice, I do do a lot of um, freelance workshops and talks at universities. So that's, again, is a way of um, engaging people in creative practice, but also the his historic, like history side of what I do, London or go to a bigger city living in a small town. So the, you know, the ornate details of a, a large city was always drew me to those places. Right. Um, and then it wasn't until I moved to Bristol and realized that there was a lot of them that were actually decaying and that I was like, oh, this is really sad that these are being completely gone. You know, they're, 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 they're fading away almost. Um, I should do something about that and start draw that's when I started drawing them. And then it's just become an obsession and a lifetime project. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's see how you uh, create these, uh, these, these memories or how you record these memories. You're using uh, two different kind of process. And what I'd like to do is um, if we can go to your, um, to your bench where you're going to show us um, how that works. And uh, we're going to also see the inks you use, and I'll ask Michael to uh, to jump in at that time. I see that there is a. Before we do that, I see there is a question or a comment here uh, from Martin. Um, Gemma, having produced a body of work, how do you envisage engaging with a wider community using that work? Is it going to be by exhibiting, selling, etc.? Uh, so this year. I was commissioned by the Townscape Heritage Project in Birmingham, and they commissioned me to make two, two bodies of work that recorded two abandoned factories in the historic Drury Quarter. And the reason for that commission was to engage people in our historic buildings and the fact that they are fading away. So that exhibition also included a series, like three workshops, two artist talks and a panel discussion. And not only was that obviously engaging people in printmaking and how I make work and um, other artists like photographers. It also then engaged people about their community and their environment and to actually kind of walk down the street and pay attention to buildings. So, you know, looking up at the, the you know, ornate details of windows made by the Victorians, for example. Um, so that's kind of how I engage people in my process and practice is that as well as my own practice, I do do a lot of um, freelance workshops and talks at universities. So that's, again, is a way of um, engaging people in creative practice, but also the his historic, like history side of what I do. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. I think it's great. So let's go to your, uh, let's go to your bench here for a moment yeah. and just tell you say hi my name is Michael Crane I make the inks that Gemma's going to be using and um, interestingly we are one of those people we're now in South Wales but we vacated one of those old factories when we moved here in my grandfather's time in 1977 we moved out of London and when my grandfather was a very old man I took him back to what used to be our old factory which is now beautiful apartments and somebody saw us loitering and invited us in and we explained, well, this used to be a color house. And they said that explains why every time they drilled into the wall to hang up a picture, color would come out of the walls. So uh, that's an example of, of a building which wasn't demolished, but in now beautiful homes. Back to you, Gemma. <laughs> that's a wonderful story. Um, I love that. Um, can you, I hope you can hear me okay. Yeah. Um, so this is a copper plate. Uh, so this is the substrate that I mainly use to make my etchings on. And um, when this is fresh, I would use um, a ball of wax and coat the copper plate with the wax, which is then acid resist. And then use um, a needle and glide the needle across the surface of the wax, which will reveal the copper underneath. That is then submerged in a bath of acid and the acid bites down into the copper leaving inside lines which will hold ink when it comes to print. So this is really mainly the main tool I use and a scraper and burnisher which I'll then use to add highlights after putting an aquatint on the plate. Um, shall I now show you how I ink up the plate? Absolutely that would be great thank you. So, So 
So I use a uh, Cranfield etching ink and my favorite is Aquatint Black. And the reason why I, I'm not just saying this because Michael's on the call, but I do, <laughs> <laughs> it is actually my favorite inks to use when I'm printing my etchings because um, as you can see, the, the consistency of the ink is, I just find it's, it's perfect for, for doing the job. So there's no need to, a lot of etching inks are really stiff and you're here for ages kind of like manipulating it to get it to a stage where it will flow into the aquatint really nicely. These inks just, I mean, look at that, for viscosity, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, so once uh, I've got the ink, did you have a question, Isabel? No, no, go ahead, sorry. No, sorry. Um, so then to apply the ink onto the plate, I use just one of these decorating rollers, which not a lot of printmakers seem to use. They use like a, an old fashioned dabber. But I find this is the quickest way and the most effective way of applying ink to the plate. So I load my roller with ink and I then go across the surface of the plate. So my plate is on a hot plate. I don't know if you can just show them that way. And I ink up the plate hot so that the ink flows much more easily into all the lines that has been created by the acid. Uh, roll this up. Michael, while um, uh, Gemma is doing that, can you give us a, a brief explanation of what's different about a etching ink from a relief ink? Yeah. Of course. From a litho or letterpress ink. <laughs> of course, yeah. So the for those of you that are unfamiliar with the terminology, perhaps you can see this behind me. On a relief print, what you want to print is in relief. It's raised. Okay. What we're seeing here is an etching where what we want to print is cut away. And the main difference is relief printing is exceptionally forgiving. You can print... Um, and make an ink for relief printing out of soot and petrol, basically. Uh, don't try that, but you can make something very simple and, and it will work. Etching is a far more tetchy process, far more uh, on a fine balance of whether it'll work or not. And we uh, describe the phenomena or the science of how things flow as rheology, R-H-E-O-L-O-G-Y. And rheology has two factors. It has viscosity, and viscosity is defined as the reluctance to flow. And it, rheology also has tack, which is stickiness. And thinking from your kitchen, uh, you could think of butter out of the fridge. That has very high viscosity. It's not flowing anywhere. But if you put your finger over the top of the butter, there's no resistance. It's not sticky. So that would be one rheology we could put on a graph. Now, also from your kitchen, especially for you, Isabel, in Canada, think of beautiful, clear Canadian honey or syrup. Now, if it's in the jar and we take the lid off, the viscosity is so low that we can pour it out of the jar. But the tack is very, very high. If you put your finger in it, it's very sticky. If we get the rheology wrong on an etching ink, just as Gemma was saying a moment ago, if it is too tacky, Gemma carefully puts the ink into those engravings, into the etch. And then when she wipes, as we see her doing now with the cloth, if we've got the rheology wrong, all of that ink will come straight out again. Right. So that's why we invest an awful lot of time. We take care on all of our products, but especially on etching. Litho, litho is the maddest printing process ever invented. If it really the man who invented it should have been certified and, and put away. Litho, you have a flat surface, and the only difference between the image areas and the non-image areas are the ink will stick to dry stone, and the, it, it's dry because it's water repellent. So you use a, often a, a greasy uh, a pen or a crayon, you put your image on, you then throw a bucket of water, this blue represents water, and then when you ink over the top of the, the, the oily ink, because oil and water don't mix, the oil, this roller here moving along, it won't stick to the water, it will stick to the dry stone. It's such a convoluted process 
the main requirement for a litho ink is that it needs to be very strongly uh, water repellent. And then thereafter, we look at the rheology. Um, but so, so each of the disciplines has different requirements. Um, but what we're seeing here in the uh, wiping process in the States, uh, the term is tarlatan. Here in the UK, we call it scrim. And it's a bit like those uh, Hessian shirts we used to wear in the 1970s. And if you've still got one, it'll probably come back into fashion. So don't throw it out. And we're wiping away all the excess ink. And when we see the copper plate appearing again, um, then we're ready to take a print. But the skill of somebody like Gemma is that she doesn't wipe it all away. She'll want some tone there. Otherwise, if it's too clear, yes or no, then you lose nuance. Again, I should say uh, that uh, etchers are never satisfied with their work. It's always the next print, which is going to be the good one. And um, they've either over wiped or under wiped. But uh, I think this one will be the good one, Gemma. I hope so, Michael. I did a couple of tests before we went live just to, just to see. Um, but you're completely right. Um, I will maybe print, say, 10 from a plate and half of them will be like okay i'm happy with them but yeah if anybody else was to look at that etching they'd be like what is what's wrong with that print but you know as a printmaker you just know that actually yeah, i did wipe off too much there or i polished too much back or i wish i left more ink on um, so uh, how many more minutes shall i just uh, say a little more about the ink itself or are you just about to... um i'm gonna um i'm gonna go and block my paper so you Fine. could definitely yes yeah, in which case so let me tell you a bit about what is in the ink. The oil-based inks are very, very natural. The, uh, on this picture behind, you'll see we've got a couple of pictures of, of barrels. They contain what we in the trade call a vehicle. And we call it a vehicle because it's carrying the bit which you really want, which is the color. And the color here, the pigment, we've simply drawn three bags because there are three sources of pigment. and. Um, the biggest, of course, is black, and black is essentially soot. The method of producing black pigments hasn't changed in generations. Now, I uh, am third generation uh, in this business, but the pigment business has been uh, around for uh, thousands of years, and black, one of the oldest pigments, is produced by burning anything in insufficient oxygen. So you'll remember when you stayed with your grandparents as a child and they had a paraffin heater or paraffin lamp, if the wick was too long for the limited amount of oxygen in the glass bulb on top of the paraffin heater or paraffin lamp, what happened? Well, soot appeared, it gutted soot. Well, that's actually how black pigment is, is produced. Very cleverly, one burns anything and the, there's a very, very long chimney. The chimney doesn't go straight up, it goes at an angle. And as the carbon soot gets colder, as it goes up this very long chimney, of course it falls. But rather than falling and extinguishing the fire, it falls on the inside of the chimney. And whilst the process has been industrialized, essentially that's how blacks are still made to this day, to this day uh, um, uh, burning anything to make the result. And it depends what you burn, gives you the density of black. Some are very brown black, some are blue, uh, some are midnight blacks, but the principle is very much the same. So that's the first bag. Can There's... we just go back to, uh, to Gemma, please? Sorry, because she's just yeah, about do. ready to, uh, uh, to show us her, uh, her next step there. Um, so if you wanna just a little bit closer today. So um, I soak my paper prior to printing and what the soaking does, it relaxes all the fibers in the paper to make it malleable, which will then, when I use the etch and press, because there's so much pressure going under that plate onto the paper, it will pull out the ink that has just been pushed into those lines um, and it will kind of attract it onto the paper. So I'm using um, a Somerset satin and it's made literally down the road from where I live. And it's 100% cotton rag paper. <laughs> I'm just going to get off this moisture off, off that sheet. And then blot the paper between the blotting. So you dry the paper now, that's what you're doing? Yes, yeah, so I'm just going to blot that 
Um, while you're doing that, there's a question from uh, uh, Jan. Do you only use the tarlatan for wiping or do you use tissue paper to get some real sharp whites? Um, I often use my finger so that um, I will put my finger in chalk and that will give me the highlights I, I need. Um, but yeah, most people do use tissue paper flat to um, kind of pick up the ink that's lurking off the surface. Right. Um, so once I can see no water onto my paper, I know that's good to then put onto the plate and to pour the print. So I'm going to go over to the extra press now. Okay. So I'm going to lay my paper face down onto the pop plate. And I've marked out where it will go onto the bed so that hopefully it will be, it'll be nicely registered. What, what is that that you're putting on? Oh, it's just a layer of tissue paper and that just absorbs any ex excess moisture from the paper so that it doesn't dampen the blankets too much. Right. So they've got three sets of blankets on the press. The top one is what's called a swan skin and then there's two fronting blankets which then kind of help with the pressure. The tissue paper also keeps the blankets clean. Right. I'm sure printmakers have been murdered by their colleagues for getting blankets filthy before now. So um... <laughs> you can see my blankets. I accidentally have got some markings on them. Um, so now this is the magical moment because I, I have no idea how this print has plated, a print how this plate is printed until I reveal it. And this is my favourite thing about printmaking. You'll get soup, or I will. And Beautiful. It looks pretty gorgeous to me. <laughs> you know, I'm happy with that one. Um, so then I would, I'll put it down here. So then after I've printed the plate, I would then dry this under boards for a few days so that it dries nice and flat. And it, if I was to leave this out to dry, it would just cockle. So it has to be dried under boards so that doesn't happen. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, you can make as many copies as you want of that. Is that right? Um, because it's got an appetite on the plate, I could probably get to maybe about 40, 50 before it starts to break down because of the pressure it goes through the press. Right. Um, and to stop that, you then you can still face the plate so that you can then get hundreds of copies from that plate. Right. But I normally addition mine to about 30. Um, after that, I'm a bit sick of looking at it and want to put it away in a drawer. Okay, there was a comment about, uh, and I think that spoke to the, uh, the the sensorial experience. Someone commented on the sound of your uh, of the press when you were uh, t turning the handle, and it has that little industrial squeakiness. <laughs> yeah. I know. I think it needs oiling. It sounds like I've got a little mouse hiding in the handle. <laughs> <laughs> Um, fantastic. So maybe before, um, oh, a question. Um, what brand is your press, please? It's a polymetal. So it's made in the Netherlands and it's the JW80 series. Um, and the reason why I got this brand is because it can withstand a lot of pressure. Um, I used to work in a college and the students used to absolutely batter it. So I knew that it, it would last me a lifetime. Right. So uh, while you go back to uh, to your desk and get things uh, organized, we're gonna before we move to uh, show your art, uh, uh, Michael. Why don't we carry on yeah. with the other colors? So we've mentioned blacks. Then the next uh, source of pigment is earth <coughs> earth colors, and they will be things such as sienna, umber, all those browns and yellows. Um, they are wonderful colours. The difficulty is that they come literally from the ground and the seams often run out. So the, the, whoever's mining the colour will have to move on. And so then you get variations from batch to batch. Also, they contain iron impurities. 
So that's why you printmakers will know if you're uh, printing with a genuine earth, anything with iron in will dry very quickly. It also is, they're very gritty. So they tend to scratch a plate. Certainly they're hard on our machines when we're making them. So that's why sometimes we would choose to use the third uh, group of pigments, which are known as synthetic organic. The synthetic, here's a nice yellow, an, uh, an ergolite yellow. Now, the, the term synthetic shouldn't be terrifying. It simply means it's been synthesized, it's been man-made, but they are often man-made equivalents of what one could find naturally, but they're made by the same people that make your headache tablets. They're made by the pharmaceutical industry who make them with great care. The reason why we use a synthetic uh, instead of a genuine can be uh, varied. Sometimes the pigment will be coming from a politically unstable part of the world. So lapis lazuli coming from Afghanistan is not very sensible. So that is why uh, instead ultramarine blue was developed. Interestingly, ultramarine is nothing to do with the color, not that it looks like the color of sea. It means that actually it replaced a pigment that used to come over the sea. And so yeah. it was produced uh, by a German uh, um, physicist, uh, chemist, uh, at about 1820. And uh, so that's why ultramarine is used uh, instead of lapis lazuli. Other colors that have fallen into disuse would be things like Indian yellow. Perhaps some of you know the dreadful story. Indian yellow used to be made from uh, feeding mango leaves to uh, cows in India. That's the only thing they ate until their pea turned yellow and you collect the pea and then you dry it in the sun. Well, quite rightly, because of animal husbandry, that has stopped. And so we'd use a synthetic instead. So lots of synthetics, there's nothing wrong with them. Um, they are part of the major steps forward in, in um, ink. All sorts of things have happened over the years. In uh, 1880, an invention to come alongside better pigments was the invention of the collapsible metal tube which meant that companies like ourselves could make and send inks around the world. Up until then, there used to be an ink maker on every corner, or at least an ink maker near every monastery, because it was the monastic orders that were the early printers. And so there would be regional uh, inks. Now there's less of us and we export, thanks to better pigments and the collapsible tube. Back to you, Gemma. I have to say that I, uh, I watched your video. Um, you have a little video on your website. Oh, sure. yes. Uh, how to make the the tubes and it's it's an extraordinary thing and I, I have i never thought how do you make a tube but yes there's a machine that does that folding perfect folding. Yep. that's very interesting <laughs> yeah we, we we fill it from the wrong end the cap is already in place we fill it from this end and then seal the end yes you're right, right. <laughs> i've just put the website so that everybody wants to look at the film later can go on and uh, that's in chat oh that's great thank you so um Gemma, show us now how we uh uh, we're gonna. I'm, I am going to show. Sorry, I'm going to share my screen and show your art. Um, and we're going to talk about what you have created, and then we will bring uh, Michael in as um, as needed. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. So here we are. Tell us about this Hi. amazing place. So this was um, when I was saying that I, when I first went to Bristol, this, there was a building that kind of captured my imagination and this was that building. So the story of this was that it was, um, it belonged to an, uh, the new jail. So it was built in the 18th century and this is the remaining gatehouse. But when I started doing research at the Bristol Record Office, um, I discovered that it used to also be an execution platform. So where I had been standing, like drawing and photographing, hundreds of people would have been hung above me. And I found that a bit spooky, but also very interesting that not many people knew this history of this form. And that's what then sparked this interest in historic buildings, especially ones that are decaying and abandoned and almost needing to make work to give them a second voice. Right. And uh, so from this from this place, I started going around the city and finding more dereliction. And I think the next slide is, um, these are quite big etchings. These were the first etchings I made. So they're 60 by 42, and they are a form of documentation of an old abandoned chocolate factory. 
Um, and the chocolate factory is Elizabeth Shaw. They're like these little mints that mm. um, are quite tasty. Uh, so this is, also, this was a Elizabeth Shaw so, are also quite cheap. They're very good if you're going out for dinner because they look extravagant, yes. but didn't cost you too much. <laughs> that is very true. Um, so their <laughs> factory, this was closed down in uh, sometime in the 1980s, but they've moved premise to, they're still in Bristol, but down by the Portway. And this was a really fascinating place. It was just one of the first industrial spaces that I had kind of explored and gone into. Uh, and again, it was filled with graffiti. Um, so it's kind of like this collection of artists who had been exploring the space, leaving their markings. Um, and so I kind of started making a series of etchings based on this location, um, mm -hmm. exploring scale, mark making size, and really loving how etching could get that gorgeous blacks, uh, you know, the real velvety richness. Uh, so after Bristol, well, uh, since being in Bristol, all those places have pretty much been demolished. So I started going into Wales. So uh, Wales used to be obviously heavily, mined, like there used to be a lot of mining culture there, which is now, you know, it's obsolete. Uh, and so you get these really brilliant industrial spaces where that had loads of history. And this, this image in particular is of the old Kim Coke Works site. And, you can see the amount of paint that is peeling off the surface of the brick um, and the decay that's happening. Uh, so I think the next slide is also off the same note. Um, and as you can see, there's like a welly boot. I think this is one with the welly boot on. Maybe it's a different slide. I didn't, uh, sorry, I didn't put the one with the welly boot on. Um, but um, uh, oh, That's okay. So. But this is a great site. This is a great photograph because actually you can see how nature has started to reclaim the land and it's it's kind of coming in through the window sills. Like people then arsons go in and they set fire, they break glass. And it almost gives nature that kind of, okay, I'm going to start taking this place back. Mm -hmm. And it's quite powerful. And yeah, Gemma, even do, if we do you climb don't... over barbed wire fences to get in or do you, how do you look around these places? <laughs> Um, I don't know if I should say this on, cam well, on camera. No, nobody's yeah. listening. No, You're okay. No, don't no, tell us then. Okay. Uh, sometimes, <laughs> I, you know, I, yeah. Um, huge admiration. I'm very, very impressed. Very impressed. Uh, they, yeah, they are amazing spaces. And actually, the most recent work that I've been doing, I've actually gained official access. So um, I'm not having to uh, dip in and out wearing all black like a ninja. Mm. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> So I picked that photo because of the uh, the perspective of both uh, both these views that we can see here again. I think um, uh, absolutely amazing. And um, you were talking about the the blackness of the ink, um, Michael. When you look at a at a piece like that, what comes to mind as a as an ink maker? In a few words. Yeah. Uh, in a few words, the wonder of oil based products. Oil-based inks are very lazy, and they stay where you put them. And if you do, we do make water-based, although my heart's not in it. If you were to use a water-based <laughs> ink, they would have, there would be a grayness, a disappointment. Oil-based inks, you choose your oil. So here's a very runny oil. If it's a particularly absorbent pigment, if it's not absorbent, then you use a very uh, stiff oil like this, which doesn't flow so you we make the product to, to sit there so when i look at that the density is is wonderful and uh, only achievable from oil based and, and yet it's a, a beautiful thing to see mm. um so i love these two because of these arches um that open it to me it's possibilities i don't know why these two arches uh, evoke that in my mind I think you're right. There's um, in abandoned spaces. There are there is hope because you've got all this nature coming in, and it's flooded with light. And I love visiting an abandoned building after it has rained because you get these absolutely brilliant reflections in the water. Um, and this one in particular, like the arch windows. This is a Victorian, an old Victorian factory. Again, uh, I think it's just outside Pontypool in Wales and it used to be something to do with coal mining. Um, so again, just, just recording the brickwork and that type of arch in the window is a record of that 
time. Mm -hmm. Completely different style here. Yeah, so this was this was one of the pieces that I made for the commission for the jewelry quarter. Um, and this is the most this is the biggest work that I've made. So it's um the plate size is 164 by by 80. So it's quite a big etching. There's two two plates that make up one image. Um, and again, it's uh, I absolutely love this building because of the reflections um, and the ornate windows. Um, you know, these, these buildings were built for optimum light so that jewelers could set the stones with you know, perfect light um, while right. still working. But I think it's important to note that, so this one to me doesn't look as um, uh, uh, detailed or as crisp in its detail as the other one, which I'm sure was um, intended. But it's important to note that every um, shadow is, is a, a, um, is a motion of you on the plate um, to create to create that effect. Absolutely, and I, I did actually have a bit of a battle with this plate because of the size, the amount of. So I do quite a lot of open biting in my work, so that means putting the plate in acid without any acid resist on the plate to kind of get rid of the marks I had already made. So um, you know, when you take on an etching, you're taking on something that you. I never know the end result. It's always evolving. Every etch I do, it will evolve. Um, and then I will know what to do for the next time I come to put it in acid or put a hard ground on. So for me, this one was a real challenge because I just had to keep on open biting it, putting a ground on, redrawing. So it went in and out the acid probably about 12 times before I thought, okay, I'm happy with this now. Right. Um, oh, amazing. Um, the next uh, the next slide again gives us this I mean it's you can you can see the sun on that wall there yeah I loved I love this building it's called unity works and it's in the jewelry quarter and again you you know this the sense of how big these windows are to, to to allow all this light to come flooding in is is breathtaking when you're in a, an abandoned space mm -hmm. especially when you're you're the only one in there in this room um, yeah. Again, yeah, it's like capturing that atmosphere. There's some fascinating stories here in South Wales because industry stopped so very quickly. A lot of the buildings were, not all Victorian buildings were strong and well uh, built, but a lot of them at the height of the Industrial Revolution, they were fine buildings and they were built to last. And there's some tragic stories. One is that um, as industry stopped, they no longer needed the rail network. And in a day when metal uh, uh, and steel was plentiful, um, some of the railway engines were just left in tunnels and the tunnels were bricked up at either end. And there's no money to take them out and restore them. But you know, if, if one had the money, they were beautifully made. As I say, at the height of the Industrial Revolution, so much money was poured into Bristol, into South Wales, and into other industrial parts of the country. And, and today, buildings, industrial buildings will last 20 years, 50 years, but- um, Not a generation or two. <laughs> yeah, a testament to how well they were built, a lot of them, yeah. So, Gemma, you've now decided that you're going to um, um, look at the decay in nature. Talk, tell, tell us about your, uh, your newest project with the uh, World Wildlife Fund. So yeah, back at the beginning of the year, I was contacted by WWF to help with a campaign to raise awareness of deforestation. And at the time, my I couldn't really focus on that at all because I was on this treadmill. Then coronavirus hit and all of a sudden I was forced to pause and I started researching into their campaign, realizing that, you know, how, devastating and how fast and rapid we are actually destroying the Amazon rainforest all for greed and wealth and that is having a massive impact on climate so I decided to propose a project about working with um, another printmaker called James Harrison and he's based in Glasgow so together we're making a series of work that will aim to raise awareness of deforestations we're looking at different forests around the world starting with the Amazon then going into California fires. Um, we're going to do one on Britain on the HS2 line because that is just, you know, that's just destroying lots of ancient woodland. 
Um, so we are using two processes which we haven't seen used before. So it's a it's really exciting project to work on. So we are, so James is a screen printer and he's using a pigment called Lit, which charges in the day and glows insanely bright at night or in the dark. Um, on top of his drawing and illustration, which will uh, be a celebration of the rainforest, but also it will have the frets of that, that habitat. On top will be my a lithograph, which is an atmospheric kind of my understanding of how I'd feel maybe if I was in that space at that time. So they're merged together and they're going to, we're kind of nearly at the finish, but nearly at the end point of making our first print and it looks slightly insane. I can't wait to share with people. Well, let's, um, what we've been doing. Uh, let's have a look at what you, uh, what you sent me so far. Um, which are, I think, some, some studies. It's not quite a finished piece of work, that. No, so originally we were gonna do uh, screen printing and etching. Uh, so these were the first kind of etchings that I made in response to the data that WWF had sent me. Uh, so this is just me trying to get my head around fire and how I can, um, how I can create that using etching. Um, it turns out that etching and screen printing don't marry up very well um, because the lit is slightly, because there's a particle, it's got a slightly textured grainy surface to it. So when I was then printing my etching on top of the screen print, I was finding that I was losing a lot of the evident tones within my own work. So we then moved on to exploring lithography in screen print and that has worked brilliantly. So this is a, a, a picture of James uh, kind of looking at my prints and doing a bit of research on the, you know, the tribes that live in the Amazon. Right. And that is the, uh, the glow in the dark. This is a challenge to Michael. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anything um, luminescent, you need a really thick film weight. And that's why screen can do it because screen will be 25 microns, 30, 40 microns thick. Poor old printmakers are lucky if you get a film weight of five microns. So sadly, these technologies are beyond us. Absolutely brilliant. They're really impressed, Gemma, really impressed. Yeah, thank you. So the, that's a picture of it completely in pitch black and it shines so intensely bright. Um, mm, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, I just want to share that, uh, that slide so everybody can see your website because Gemma does sell her work on her website. Um, and, you know, Christmas is coming up. So I've seen a lot of nice comments about her work. Maybe it's something that you want to treat yourself to. Obviously, it is on my website and I will share it in the, uh, the link to the video tomorrow. But if you want, make note now. And also note the, uh, the website of Matthew Walder, who took this I think it's a beautiful photo of Gemma when we were in her uh, in her studio. Um, so, um, I think that we have come to the uh, almost the end of our hour. I don't know if we have more questions. Um, I just want to. Yes. I just want to say um, I also have added. Um, promo code onto my website so if anybody was interested in buying a piece if you were to type in conversation in capitals then you get 20, uh, 10 percent off your order oh amazing thank you so much that's uh, that's so very kind of you thank you uh, i'm just gonna so i don't see any question i don't know if um anybody has any more questions but uh, Gemma and Michael thank you so very much it's mm -hmm. it's always such a great pleasure I know that we could have carried on talking for hours uh, pigment and paper and uh, scratching and and etching and all that um, really it was it was great to, uh, to <laughs> And next week is our last in our paper series and we are going to uh, Somerset to a paper mill and it's a very small paper mill only has four uh, people there. It's a water mill and it's a, a fully working one. The uh, owner Jim is absolutely exquisite. We're gonna have a fantastic hour together. Um, I wanted to also mention to you that we do have a workshop coming up a bookbinding workshop in January, which is part of this series, it with um, with Kate Holland, 
Uh, do place your order uh, quickly. You'll see there's four workshops available. You can buy one or you can buy um, uh, three, sorry, three workshops available. You can buy one or you can buy three of them or two of them as you wish. And do place your order quickly because uh, all the material and the tools are coming from the UK and it takes a little while to ship that. So uh, don't delay. We also have, and I will put it on the website this afternoon, a cooking class. Uh, Italian Christmas cooking. I thought it would be nice to, you know, dive a little bit into the art of food just before Christmas. The Italians do it in a different way. Uh, it will take place with Chef Enid Grace and it will take place in my kitchen um, because her cooking school, it's on, a, it's on a Sunday and her cooking school is where her uh, restaurant and is and it's going to be too noisy. So she's going to come to my house and she's coming to the kitchen of the woman who doesn't cook because I really don't cook. So I hope <laughs> that you'll join that. <laughs> hey, I'm glad I'm not the only one. Yeah, well, that's good. <laughs> and um, if you are a club member and you uh, sign up for any of the classes or workshops, remember to put your code in there. You're entitled as a club member to have a 10% discount. So uh, thank you, everybody. Have a fantastic rest of the day and rest of the week. I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. Bye bye. All. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Isabel. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Isabel, can I ask you a question? Yes, of course. Um, like I'm late into this process, unfortunately. So I've yeah. missed a lot of the ones that were before. Yeah. Um, I was a member, but unable to do them. So is there a way for me to go back and see them? Absolutely. All the conversations, the recordings are on the members page on the website. I will okay. send you the, uh, I'll send you the link. If you link, have great. There's a password to go behind the uh, the members wall on the website, so I'll send you that too. Okay, so I only wish we could actually be there in these studios. <sighs> well, uh, like, I'm like drooling because I'm going, oh my God, look at all that ink. Let's go check that out. Look at those beautiful etchings. Yuck, oh, oh, look at all those tools. <laughs> the trips are ready as soon as we can uh, as soon as we can travel we'll all go together I'll, uh, I, I promise you I have more itineraries ready to push the button on than, than we can ever take so uh, I'm looking forward to traveling with you.